Do you feel guilty when you eat a nice, juicy steak? No need. I will tell you how you can make sustainable choices and still eat meat and dairy as part of your regular diet. Why you don't need to be vegan to save the planet. This is the University of the Netherlands. There is so much information and misinformation out there on how to eat sustainably, it can be overwhelming. Most of us are doing our best to make the right choices, but it's so confusing we're all coming up with different answers. Food choices are deeply personal and more diverse than ever. My family is no exception. I eat mostly plant-based, but I really love dairy and I eat meat occasionally, maybe once or twice a year. My older brother, on the other hand, is strictly vegetarian. My parents tell us that they're eating more plant-based, but we all know they're still having bacon in secret. My partner and my son are flexitarian, but three days vegetarian meals is the absolute limit. And my younger brother is a real dedicated meat lover. So our holiday dinners are complicated, fun, but complicated. We're all trying to make the right choices. It's just not that easy to know what the right choices are. I've been busy with this for a long time. I've been working as a protein scientist for the last 16 years and for the last two years as a program manager in Wageningen. In Wageningen, my job is to work together with our amazing scientists to create a shared vision about how we can feed the world population with the least possible damage to our planet. What I know now is the solution does not require going to extremes. The most sustainable future does not require a planet full of vegans. The science tells us that you can eat a diet that looks a lot like what you're eating now if you're willing to shift in proportions. In this lecture, I'll explain why, and I'll translate that to recommendations for how you can be part of positive food systems into the future. When we talk about sustainability, we need to be talking about proteins. Of all our nutrients, proteins have the heaviest environmental footprint. And when I talk about environmental footprint, I mean land use, water use, and greenhouse gas emissions. Proteins are, on the other hand, an essential nutrient for our bodies. They're made up of amino acids, and we break down the proteins into those amino acids and use them to build tissue like muscle. Children, for example, who don't get the nine essential amino acids they need from their diets can't grow properly and suffer from what we call stunting. Older adults who don't get sufficient protein lose muscle and become frail as they age. The good news is proteins are present in almost every food, but of course at different levels. So lean meats like chicken breasts uh, are basically only protein in water and have about 20 to 30% protein. You probably also think about milk, eggs, dairy products like cheese as typical protein sources, and they are, but the world's biggest single protein source is actually wheat. And brown bread is typically seven to 8% protein, and we compare that to milk, milk is only actually about 3% protein. Other good sources of protein, uh, beans, nuts, and seeds, really great. Chickpeas have about 19% protein, and even regular green peas have about 8% protein. So I've told you about proteins as a nutrient, now I'm actually gonna tell you that you don't need to worry too much about proteins as a nutrient, because if you're an average European consumer, um, typically you get plenty of protein from your regular diet, even if you're eating vegetarian, as long as you're eating a regular, varied, natural diet, you're probably getting all of the amino acids and all of the protein that you need. I would be worried about you if you're gonna tell me you're gonna only eat peas from now on. You would, for example, potentially develop a methionine deficiency, but actually if you're eating peas and you're also eating bread at some point in the day, you're getting complete protein nutrition and you don't really need to worry. Um, typically in Europe, we actually get on average more protein than we need, up to one quarter or a third of our protein is just extra above the sort of minimum required amount that we need. It's not a problem for our health to eat extra protein. Actually, especially if you're elderly or if you're an athlete, it can be a good thing. But it is a problem if you're trying to follow a sustainable diet. Remember, protein has the biggest environmental footprint of any of our food components. There's another problem that's making our protein system inefficient right now, and that is that in almost every rich country, we're eating more animal proteins than ever. So on average, we're getting about two thirds of our protein from animal sources like meat, eggs, and dairy. Um, and that's inefficient, inherently inefficient. Why? Because animals don't actually make protein, they convert protein. Plants make protein. They grow, they pick up nitrogen from the soil, and they grow and they convert that into proteins that we can eat. 
Microorganisms also make protein. You can grow bacteria with sort of any carbohydrate and a little bit of nitrogen hanging around, and they'll create protein for us. Animals, on the other hand, are like us. They actually get in protein from their diets, and they use that to make body tissue, muscle mass. Some animals are better converters than others. So cows, for example, require up to 20 kilograms of, of protein from grass or grains that they eat to create one kilogram of beef. Chickens, on the other hand, are a lot more efficient. We can give them uh, up to two kilograms of feed proteins to get out uh, a kilogram of eggs or chicken meat. Insects, which you've probably heard about as a potential future protein source, are the most efficient animals, but they're still animals. They're converting protein. And I don't know about you, but I'm not really excited about eating insects. A more efficient solution is to eat those plant proteins ourselves. So we'd like to move a little bit away from the animals, less animal proteins, and more sustainable alternatives, for example, from plants. The question is, how do we get there? And today we're going to talk about three directions of change that we think can help us get there. So one, we're going to look into this category that is called meat alternatives, things that look like meat but are actually coming from plants. Uh, and we're going to dive into the example of making a burger from pea protein. Number two, we're going to look into some sustainable alternative protein sources like duckweed and quinoa and how they can become a part of our regular diet. And number three, we're going to circle back and we're going to talk about why you don't need to be vegan, but what are the things you should be conscious of if you want to contribute to sustainable food systems. So the solutions. The first and maybe easiest solution for a consumer is products that look and taste like meat but are actually made from plants. This meat alternatives section of the grocery store exploded in the last five years, and Vakeningen has been a part of making that happen. We, for example, made a kind of chicken-like texture from soy using a process called extrusion. Uh, and in the meantime, we're also working on developing a plant-based steak, a real sort of chunk of something that looks very meat-like. The plus side of these products is that they make change easy. You can basically keep on eating the same meal. You can keep on cooking pretty much the same way you always did. We know there's room for improvement in the taste, but actually I think we've made good progress and these products keep getting better. Uh, and we think they will keep getting better in the coming years. On the other hand, these meat alternatives or meat analogs are not a perfect solution either. They're not very easy. It's not easy to convert a plant into something that looks and tastes and cooks like meat. It costs us a lot of energy and it costs us a lot of water, all of which contribute to the environmental footprint. Let's dive into the example of making a burger from yellow peas. So the first thing we need to do is grow a yellow pea plant. The next thing we do is take the seed. Peas, like all pulses, are actually just the seed of that plant. So we harvest that small piece, and this is what we use to process further. We grind up the peas, we mix them into water, and then we separate out the protein. There's another inefficiency here in this separation step. In fact, we typically only get about 50% of the protein that's in there when we're trying to separate the protein out. We've also added water in the process of getting that protein solubilized into water, and we have to remove that water afterward, which costs a lot of energy. Drying is a very intensive step. We take this dry protein powder, we mix it with other ingredients, and we make a kind of sticky dough. We take this dough through the extruder, which sort of works the dough into a texture. Um, a good mental picture for that is kind of like what a bread kneader does. After it comes out of the extruder, it's a little bit firmer, it's got some texture, and we add flavors and binders. We sort of mix and grind this whole thing and shape it into a plant-based burger, and that's what comes to you in the supermarket. That was a lot of processing steps, and a lot of processing steps is not what we prefer because each one introduces inefficiency and costs us energy. Actually, we can calculate that whole thing. We can calculate the inputs all the way from the seed to your table. And I can say this plant-based burger is probably more sustainable still than a beef burger. But as the example showed, there's still a lot of room to make this more sustainable. And we are continuously working on ways to optimize each step. For now, if you want to make the most sustainable choice, open a can of peas and make a lovely pea curry for dinner that will always be a better choice than a pea-based burger. I know I can't ask you to eat peas every day. I actually recommended you not to eat peas every day. <laughs> so let's jump over to some other new protein sources on how we can use them uh, to increase our protein consumption from plants. I'm in particular interested in sources that can be produced with less land and less water because those are our limiting resources right now. 
If we look here in the Netherlands, where farmland that we call arable land is limited, um, we quickly come to the need to grow proteins on other resources, and resources like aquatic sources can be very interesting. So we're looking at proteins that can grow on either sweet or salty water. One example of such a protein source is water lentils, also known as duckweed. Um, and if you're curious about duckweed, you can actually go outside, walk to a local pond, and you'll probably see duckweed growing there almost anywhere in the world. By the way, don't eat that duckweed. <laughs> it's not grown in a food safe way, uh, but you can have a look. What's interesting about duckweed is that it grows exponentially. So one plant splits into two, which makes it a really efficient grower. And it also has a really high protein content of up to 35% when it's dried. Furthermore, it tastes a lot like spinach, which makes it pretty accessible for most of us. Um, so it's a really interesting potential source for the future. Another issue that we're looking at, and that's becoming increasingly relevant while climate change is happening, uh, is increasing salinity or saltiness of the lands near the sea. For those lands, which we probably won't be able to use in the same way in the future that we're using them now, we need to look at crops that can grow on, on salty soil. So in Vakhni, we're actually working on breeding new varieties of quinoa that can tolerate this salty soil. Quinoa is interesting because it has a higher protein content than most other grains, uh, and it can be a locally grown alternative to rice. Longer term, we're actually looking at a an even more efficient option of growing protein from bacteria, which require almost no land or water to grow. Um, and actually, I think protein bacteria can be delicious. You might say no uh, if you're listening to this, but actually, if you like cheese and yogurt, I think you should be saying yes. Basically, yogurt and cheese are made from milk and bacteria. The bacteria that are in there eat the sugars that are naturally present in milk, and they make these into flavors that we perceive when we eat those products. The bacteria themselves are essentially pure protein and they grow incredibly efficiently. The limiting factor for bacteria is that we haven't really worked on using them directly for food. So there's still a lot we don't know. And any change we make in our food system and our diets has to be done really carefully to make sure it is safe and healthy. So we're looking at this as a long-term option. Okay, so far I have you eating chickpeas, duckweed, quinoa, and bacteria. Uh, and we haven't really touched on the main question of why you don't need to be vegan. So let's circle back and put that into perspective. I know you don't only want to eat chickpeas, duckweed, quinoa, and bacteria. So the good news is you can eat sustainably without drastic changes. And yes, you can still eat meat and dairy. Why? Well, animals play an important role in our food system because they can eat things that we can't. So essentially, they can convert waste into food. We call this animals as recyclers. So think back to that yellow pea burger. If you remember, we harvested the pea, which is actually the seed of the plant, and we left behind leaves, stems, and roots. Without animals, we would just leave that material on the, on the ground. With animals, we can actually harvest that and feed it. The plant leftovers, for example, can be used as feed for pigs, and the pigs can convert those nutrients into meat, which we can then keep in our food system. It's the same story with grass. Uh, we don't eat grass ourselves. I'm not going out to pasture anytime soon, but cows eat grass and they can convert that into milk and meat that are a part of our food system. So the most efficient, most sustainable system does include animals. It's just not how we're using animals right now. Right now, most of what is fed for anim to animals, like soybeans, for example, could also be used for human consumption. And our rule in vacuuming is simple. If it's good for food, we should use it for food. Animals should eat the things that humans can't eat. We've actually put some numbers behind this and we've calculated what the most sustainable system for Europe would be. And we come to about 28 grams of animal protein per person per day. That's the equivalent of nearly a liter of milk, 329 grams of quark, or a steak of about 112 grams, which is maybe half of a restaurant steak nowadays. On average, here in the Netherlands, we're eating about 75 to 80 grams protein per day. So for us, that means about one third of our protein could come from animal sources. If you're in a place where you're closer to the minimum required amount of protein, which is about 50 grams on average, you could get half of that from animal sources. So what should you be putting on your plate if you want to help save the planet? Well, in fact, you can keep on eating the same foods if you're willing to change the proportions. If you live in a rich country, you're typically getting about two thirds of your protein from animal sources and one third from plants. We'd like to see that change. Cut your steak in half, double up on your vegetables. I'd also like to ask you to become as conscious as possible of how your meat, eggs, and dairy are being produced. 
choose for animal products produced without imported feed, seek out brands that embrace the role of animals as recyclers, and upcycling our waste. So, in conclusion, no, you don't have to be vegan. There's room for meat and dairy in the diet of the future. We need animals to create the most efficient future food system. The family meat lovers are welcome at the table. There's no need to eat your bacon in secret. Just promise me that you will also give peas a chance. Thank you so much for listening.